Hi, John. No, 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 Hi, speaker. speaker. This is Thank you. Thank you. I can repeat the same question I, I, I made to Dot Mentor. Uh, if you want to say some words about how you became a cinematographer, what were your first uh, inspiration, your childhood? To... Well, I think I, what attracts you to images? And... Well, no, I mean, I think everyone likes a film. But I think, like right, many people, like, I didn't have it made. My father had a. Uh, Pentax X SV and we were shooting photo frame slides. Remember who showed slides? We were um, stationed in uh, Aden and then Malaysia and we had beautiful pictures of photo frame, beautiful slow transparent film and we would project them on the screen. And that doesn't sound like much to people, but you've got to remember TVs were black and white and okay. to see these beautiful images on a screen. Well, you know, all things he'd seen or to be together with him, but, you know, we were in the tropics and we moved back to the grey UK and we had pictures of beautiful uh, luscious greens, emerald green seas and and uh, sort of birds, things like that. So I think that that imagery for what a camera could do or a film could do was, was very, uh, started me thinking about that. But I mean, everyone loved, everyone loves a film. And, uh, you know, I think, I didn't know how they were made, but I, I became interested. So in London, I met a bunch of other people who were interested in films, and they were trying to get work as runners. And um, some of them being on a part-time course, I tried to get into film school, but they didn't have enough money or uh, qualifications to go to film school. So we just used to make films at the weekend, which were rubbish. And, uh, you know, someone could get, uh, you know, could borrow a 16 on camera, someone could get 200 feet or any stuff, you know, reversal or black and white anything, and we would make these appalling films. And I was just a better camera guy than anybody else. We took it in terms of direct to edit, juice to be a grip, to do the lunch, you know, there was a whole group of us. And you know, some of them became, you know, quite good filmmakers. Mark Mundin, John McCarthy, who ended up, you know, being kidnapped in Lebanon, journalist, uh, Chris Martin. So there were, there were a group of us that actually went on to do different, you know, to be reasonably successful. Um, and so that didn't really lead anywhere. I couldn't get a job. The unions were horrible. They wouldn't let anybody in unless you were someone's son or a baby male. You weren't going to get a gig. And then music videos came along. And that sort of vacuumed up a lot of us because, you know, I knew the bands. I left bands. I was living in London. It's, you know, so for sort of thing. And I could shoot. Music videos, and I don't know how many I shot. I don't know if it's 300 or five, so I don't know if it's too many. And then I just thought I'd done after about 10 years of that. I still very difficult to get into drama because they know you can't shoot drama, they don't think about it. You can't shoot commercials, you never get into commercials. You can't shoot documentaries, you can always shot one and bring it in. The shrine is to fuck off. And it was all that issue. And then suddenly we became, MTV became very big, and then everyone's like, who are these people making these? things and yeah that's how I got it and then it was you know one thing after another slow so I mean it took it took uh, you know over 10 years to get to that stage where I started shooting small dramas and, um, first films and then maybe later so you know it's been 15 years or something to make a film, to actually get to where you think you are. Because I mean, with watching films, and all films are great, watching films, watching James Bond, all that stuff. But then you started watching other films, and films that nothing happened, like you know, Twin Windows, American Friend, you know, Tom Sage, and stuff. And films that were still Nicholas Road films. Why were you still thinking about them three days later? Even though these films didn't have endings, they were deflations. So, um, So um, you know what, why, why was it? Um, why was it? Why was that in my mind? And then you know, taking a lot of those things on from, you know, we were th thought as awful terrible as and not very good filmmakers um, because we did. You know, we used rock and roll lights. We we had we didn't really pay much attention to really good lenses. We sort of messing around with things. Sort of messing around 
film speeds, taking shutters out, putting shutters back in, all those things in music videos. Um, and then they became, they, that crept into commercials. And then that in turn crept into, into feature films. Um, so we, we, we went, went in on that way. We, we came in. But I say that process took about 10, 15 years to of the d directors you mentioned, uh, what did you, or individually, what benefit did you have from each of them, or some of them, that you that helped you in the process of, of improving your cinematography? I don't know. I think I think by the time I started shooting the films, I think I, think I had to know. I had to. Um, I had to know what I was doing. It's not unusual for DP to know more than a director about a sequence. You know, I mean, maybe they 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 put no touch on it, but to actually break it down, to block it, to know what it was, to know what the central part of the scene was. You know, when she says "I love you" or something, it's when you know, it's look when he walks out the door, look back at her. That's that. That's the shot. Not all the other stuff. Oh, wow, that's fucking Shakespeare. Screw that. So to to know what that was. I mean, I, you know, when I get a script, I, 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 you know, I let the scripts read it for me to read, because I'm dyslexic, and I don't like them. They don't read nicely anyway. And, you know, you wonder why some scripts don't get made, blah, blah, blah. Because a lot of them read really badly, so you've got to visualise them. So before you've even spent, spoken for them, you might have to put a film about it. I break everything down, who the characters are, what they do, how they make an entrance, how important it is, and then how to actually you know, what the transitions are between the scenes, how to get from one scene to another, but also what, what, the, what the pivot, what the pivot the point of the scene is. So well, what are they saying to me? Well, hopefully it's the same thing. I, I know what it means to me. But, I mean, you know, you're taking black and white letters off, you know, taking white script letters and trying to turn it into pictures, that's not, it doesn't, it doesn't happen, you know, it doesn't. So, you know, until you actually get there on the set, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I, one of the directors, of course, who respect them, and some of them, you know, a lot of the ones I've worked with have made many films and were much bigger directors than I would ever be a DP. Um, but still, I didn't rely on them to, this is what you're going to do. You know, I'm not, you know, I don't I go in expecting to be told what to do. You know, I have my own agenda. You know, that's why they called me. You know, I don't. You know, not, not some name I've ever had, you know, so I, I don't go to argue with them. I don't, I want to know, if they if they don't tell me what it is, I will push what I think it is, because if they can't tell me what it is, and they're directors, then I've got a problem. I suppose the guy who's supposed to put it in the box to get it up on him. So, I don't mean to sound, I know it all, but I think by the time I'm playing them, the people for, for, for films, I think I knew, you know, you, 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 you get a script, hopefully you got like the director and the script, that's, that's important. Nobody else doesn't really matter. But um, then you think, well, what, what, what can I bring to it? You know, what can I, um, in terms of really sitting down and breaking down scripts and scene by scene, I, I can't say I've done that on, on the set. When working, you're operating, what's the fun no. of You're not operating. No. I'm used to. I mean, in France, they expect it to. So I'm doing in France, so I'm doing something very small. Well, I'm doing the mode for a music video, I think, because by the time you've actually briefed an operator what you want to do, the job's kind of over. But going into a film, as again, you know, it's again, you know, if the director says, oh, well, I need to operate the camera, or whatever, or whatever, or whatever. you know, if you can't tell your operator, as a director, what the shot's about, you can't articulate that to him, then you've no business being a director. You know, it, it's not fucking... <laughs> so the interpretation of yeah. image surely must, to some extent, be a combined effort. Well, it is. But, therefore, but, it's surely up but, to you to give the, give the operator... Well, no, I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, of course I say to him, I mean, I think the shorthand, you know, an operator who knows what he's doing, or one that you know well, that we've made many films, well, you know, within a few brief sentences or even grunts and looks and discussion of lenses or whatever, you shouldn't be there, you know, just pushing it. They, they'll know exactly what we're talking about. It's not, 
It is mass communication. It's, it's not. It's not. You know, it's not. So you're not sitting there with your cameras and your paints. I can only be one who can do this. Right? Subscribe to that bullshit. You want not to be able to communicate to the people around you. And it's, films are mass communication. That's why we do them in different countries in the living area. So you can spam. So if you you must be able to articulate to your director what you think. They must be able to talk to you and to your operator. And to folks from the grip as well, you know, when is it going So that's tell us a bit please about your uh, your way of dealing with introduction and Involvement with the designer or the. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I love designers. It's great. I, I used to seem to paint myself. So, you know, I like to get my hands to it, so I don't sort of paint, paint them in my finger as now. Um, no, so, yeah, design, I love getting the art plant, you're seeing everything. Um, it's very important, I think, to get on board really early, because quite often the producers don't want to pay you, or they don't want you around, so they're trying to keep your pre production quite short. But I think it's very important to go very early. And try and you know, spend as much time as the director as you can early on because as the production moves forward, their time becomes less and less. Well, you know, they, they have less of it, they can't spend time, they've got to do casting and discussions. At the script meetings, when the script's finished, and again, 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 that same damn thing. So you've got to get in early. So I try and go early, maybe I'm paying or not paying, I try and fly out early, go to get starting locations, rejecting locations, I mean, you know, famous sort of Rejecting the patients because they, you know, they choose them because they look or smell great right, rather than actually you know, get a camera there and get a lens on there. You know. and can you can you photograph this room? Well, not really because it's too tall. You know, it's like, our lenses work like this, so this is a cinema. It's, it's difficult to understand. You know, I've been shot up here, shot up here, I've never seen the scene. I've never seen the scene before. I'd be motivated to shot it. So, always rejecting the patients, always finding places that, you know, maybe a bit more boring, but they. You, they've got distance, they've got swing, so that's important to get on the location part and then on with the art part and, and costume as well to see what colors they're using. So, I mean, I like all that, I love those creative things because they're, you know, they're working in color and stuff, but you can't really put in quite as you can't put in just put in color. But they, 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 they put costumes with color against this interior, which is a certain color, so there's that blur that you put about that. And they think sometimes you can just light that out. I said, well, no, no, you've got to, you've got to meet me at least halfway. So, you know, films don't seem to be very colourful, like that. Light bulb colours are like, you know, beautifiers, but ones that work in complementary or colour contrast opposites, so you, you have separation of things, um, not always necessary. And then, um, you know, then there's all the other stuff to do. Um, Stunts. What what difference is to your craft your craft in the outcome or digital world? Well, you don't know, to your I, thinking. I, I, I don't know. You don't like I, I don't think it did anything for, I don't think films were any better. I mean yeah, everyone thinks, oh digital, digital well, we used to call it video. Can we just call it video? And call it electronic cameras, they're still got the same fucking problems. They don't like red, they don't like blue, they don't like keys. They're, 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 if you look at a CRT scope, they don't actually have a nice clock. They don't actually have a nice curve. My film stuff that it's it bounces content and then it spikes up. There's a big problem inside and falls down the other side. I mean, I started with it, and I wasn't allowed to shoot film size stuff. I started with 73,000s, and then it came with beta packs, you know, right down, low down, half page, nice and let's go. Beta MSB, so that's what I shot. I like that shit. I'm shooting corporate rubbish and news and stuff like that. I couldn't wait to get away from it. You know, because that, that was the film actually it was, you know, if you look at, back at those things at the time, you know, sort of last night about being you know, in TV and so, so many things are woolly, the transfers are so bad. But if you go back to original negative, the quality is actually so amazing. You know, that's on, you know, FIFA, football people always used to shoot on job. You see football competitions in the 70s, you see the 1960s, they like the beautiful, sharp images, beautiful things, strong film. So I was keen to shoot on film, and I like the integrity of the colours a lot better, you know. I liked it when you had a poppy red or sort of an interesting red rather than you know, in the video that just bounces and still just goes straight to guards and through. And then the digital cameras now, 
really have problems with the LED crossover and the user of the views what they say is a they may be programmed over there. Now we start our S60 with a red in it or something from a color swatch. You put it on the subject, it looks nothing like it that will do it if it's coming through. You know, 3,200 balanced uh, lamp or a day or a HMI lamp. So, the, you know, so, and also it just veers straight off. You know, what happened to the, 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 you know, the poppy red, the orange red? It's just gone girls red, it's gone like post box red, or what in the British post. So the, the integrity of the colours is not good. And film, it does have better. Those dyes and things and whatever Kodak was doing over the years, they, they, to me, they look good. I, I don't know if it's personal tasting, do you like tea, do you like coffee, but I just prefer it. You know, a couple of, I mean, I shot films on film quite recently, and it was such a relief. And also it gave me something to do. You know, I've turned on the digital camera on the green screen. There is nothing for me to do. There really isn't. I mean, it's horseshit. I mean, I can teach anyone, like, green screen in half an hour. Really. I mean, that is it. And it's not, you know, that I didn't get into it for that. I got into it for, well, I'm a lazy bastard, I need to go to places, I need to get, get, told to get up in the morning, I need to get up early, and, you know, locations and places like that, places we'd never otherwise go to unless we were very keen explorer, tourist or something. You, that's the great thing about films, you always go round the bend in the river to the next place that you wouldn't normally go to. So that, and film, for me, was better than dragging. Now, I mean, producers are so unadventurous now, they've got five stages, please, and a fine wood never. Green screen space for you, one to the second unit, five, three other stages, they're rotating bits for set and stuff in over. That's not what it was when, you know, when I became attracted to, you know, films. So people were building enormous sets. So, so when you're um, reading scripts, mm. it must make a difference to know that it's going to be all filming. Yeah, it does. Boy, I mean, it does. It does. You look at his feelings. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with. Um, uh, me. No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, breakfast. Um, no, I'm not really. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with digital. I mean, I, I'm not a total luddite, but um, I'll do it whatever it takes. I'm, of course, I'd rather shoot like that. But if you're doing a big, massive model thing, and you know, God bless, you know. Some of these guys who, you know, Darwin and Sopley and you know, you Chris Nolan insist on shooting on film. But I mean, when you have these massive scenes of the big dead star and the planet and the thing, mm -hmm. and there's little Luke Skywalker in space, it's this big, that's too much. One or two percent of the images on film, the rest of them, sorry, not exactly what you If in fact you're making a film that's um, Nomad Lad or something like that, which is not digital, but I mean, you are going to these great sort of big, you know, Places in America that no one was really seen as like a National Geographic episode. And you know, why not shoot on the film? Why not enjoy it? Um, uh, um, why not enjoy that? Um, you know, why not enjoy that for what it is? You don't need. And I hate all that electronic crap that comes with it. I hate all that rubbish and monitors. And you can't look through the camera until the guy switches it on. It's not about it. You set the thing up. Well, look, start working. Wait till the guard switches on. That's why everything's going so to the studio. Cables and everything, monitors and everything, tents and everything. First films I made, I'm not, I'm, I'm not like all there, but the, the director stood over the back of the camera, so what then's he Just stood over the back and looked. Sometimes in a box, he just nipped over the top of the camera. And so, you know, that was, we didn't, you know, I had, when I was a chemist, I had, I mean, I looked at my guys now, they turned up with so much junk. Buckets and buckets of stuff, monsters of pages, yeah. All the kind of terror deck crap. I mean, I had three cables. I had a battery cable, a spare battery cable, and a long one in case someone had a ladder. And you could just join them all together and take the long, and that was it. That was, that was. And that's the one cave you have to worry about. But there was no other stuff. Oh, you know. You can see it's not too much. So that, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I miss that sort of, you know. Yeah, when we did, when we did, um, um, 
you know, ca film cameras are heavy. Okay. Not all, you know, used to shoot a lot on television because they don't like the lenses. I mean, it's nothing to do with the camera photos. The camera fabrics undoubtedly have better cameras. But the, I was all about the glass. As long as the film traveled nicely and got registered, it didn't really matter what the camera was. It was oh my God, I've got to shoot this, I've got to shoot that. It didn't really matter what the camera was, as long as it worked well. well now, but the lenses were all important, but to try and get a PV lens mount on an AFS camera, which was difficult, right? we didn't have to that one. But we put one on an R top, an R top that you can't, and it's just tiny. And, and, and uh, <laughs> wherever you are, <laughs> no, I'll use this. It's broken. Okay, but we just we don't even sound them right on your um my clone stop this one. So um anyway, you don't need all that um stuff and that I think that's what's relegated us more to you know studios. You know, screen screens. So, I mean I don't know, we'll go back to your question, I don't care if it's um like, Digital or whatever, but I think I'd rather shoot on film. But on a huge amount of film, with lots of effects, I don't see much point. Unfortunately, I just that I admire people do, and admire the spirit of directors and DPs that that want to do it and bless them for doing it. But I can't say honestly that this is going to make the film better. In transition between or amazing work on music videos and commercials and everything else the world of a moving picture you know what film was uh, what a big break did you have a big was there anything you could say that film made a difference to me the ones i made yeah, yeah i mean gladiator undoubtedly it was huge yeah. Yeah. but then i got a lot of films that i didn't really make and i got you know i, got this, I found this script on a bed called game of thrones in my way, and I found it about what, five years what, ago. What did you admire yeah. most about working with somebody like Ridley? Well, I mean, what he'd done before. I mean, you know, that was the thing. I mean, you know, Ridley had been scaring the crap out of me with aliens when I was 16 and younger, and, you know, I, I, you know, he'd been making films that, you know, we all looked up to, especially as, especially in, in the UK, we were quite proud of him, you know, quietly proud of him. You know, he could be a bit of a stigma and all those sort of things, but he was, you know, very, dynamic production company that still exists that was making well, very big commercials. People wanted to get these commercial books. They, if you were working for RSA, you were, you know, you were doing well as a technician, a grip, costume, whatever, you know, it's a good company to call from. Making films, yeah, he'd made some great films. Not, not, not some, not some stunning films. Recently he'd made G.I. Jane and Wise Hall, which were not perfectly fine films, but Ridley, Ridley, everyone wants to inspect something from Ridley each time. So, um, but you know, I mean, he'd made you know, Judas, which of course was sort of laid right in between with you know, people, people still you know, talk about seeing that film for the first time, walking out of the cinema with their girlfriend saying, I'm going again, and we heard going home, and then we went back in again, and they went back in again, and watched it three times in one sitting. So that, that doesn't happen that much. So yeah, so Blade Runner and an alien scared the fucking crap out of me. Um, I, was, I mean, it's just such a, you know, I remember watching that uh, a few years later. No, I watched um, Apollo 13. Yeah, it's a really well made film. I, don't know, I, don't know. I remember those guys being up next to him, the idea of these good American boys might fly off into space forever and just be lost. That awful, you know, in that very American one A. You know, it's, well, that's hell. You know, that's not, you know, me not being buried in, on Earth, you know, on very Christian Earth. You know, you're in a tin can and you are doing something you shouldn't. Well, it could come in too low and be burnt to a cinder. You know, and that, and that idea, I remember as a schoolboy thinking that's terrifying, but I mean, anyway, going through it all and what they had to do and the bravery and the, the, the genius mathematicians and five of us men had a piloted that sick thing round, swung shot, came back in, got the right finish, landed it, 
and he just looked up. It was really fun. And the next night I saw Alien, and in three shots, Ridley said, space is somewhere I shouldn't really go to. And Ron didn't do that in two hours. <laughs> so yeah, he has that ability to show you what it, you know, what space is like. It's not, it could be horrible and nasty and tricky. It's not like 2001 Speak Clean who showed you what the future's like. You know, labor, you know, which looks like that. that's what we might end up with. Acid rain, dark skies, rich people upstairs, poor people downstairs, filth. Not, nothing squeaky clean again, not sort of 2001 or something. And then, you know, um, ancient Rome, he made it real, dirty, you know, poor, nothing, you know, not, not the Shakespeare lovey looking up and down for strap and going, oh, 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 he made it the real, visceral, even classicists who didn't, who, you know, it was wrong, they were wrong in many ways, it was wrong historically, architecturally, you know, he mixed of Georgian, Roman, you know, the, yeah, the empire, imperial, classical, Things that were happening at the end of the Georgian period in the UK, he mixed the, the Napoleonic classicism, fascism, all together in that film. But the, the big critics said they gave him a thumbs up, so yeah, we like it. So he, he you know, he creates worlds and he creates Blade Runner, he creates Alien, he creates Roman. You know. um, so, uh, you know, that was, I mean, you know, I knew what, I knew, I knew him, I didn't know him. I knew what I could, I, you know, I've been uh, grown up with it, and it was in me, and I liked it, and I could copy it, and emulate it, and do it, make it. But one of the most praised uh, pictures for Gladiator was the cinematography. Uh, but um, how did you feel when five of the Oscars went to other departments and you were left in the cold? <laughs> Okay. Well, it's what it is. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it, it, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a good looking film, you know, and I, I think I like and read up in my ideas of Cameron's life. It didn't, it didn't look like his other films. Um, when I was his first DP, I had been his assistant, so I was, so I had a sort of edge. That's funny. Awards. He kicked out. How has your relationship been to operators? Have you had a, a regular operator? Or? Yeah, well, now I've got a few. I mean, you know, they're always busy. I mean, it's good, busy. You know? So I've got, I've got a few who've been with me for years. I'm all going a bit on now. Knees again. <laughs> it's a bit alarming. No, I've got assistants who are like retired. No, I mean, I've had them for years, and I know them. It's difficult because, you know, obviously, they're working, they're in demand. Um, I don't hold them back, you know. Um, if they ring me up, so if I've got something, I say, well, go and do it, you know. Because, you know, you know, you know films fall in their faces. I've lost two this, this autumn, just don't have both of them. And he, he, um, they fell down. You know, you had to ring around quickly and say, um, you, you know, get out and do something. I'm very keen not to, you know, confirm people at the last minute because then I don't want to disappoint them. Because it does happen, you know, you, you fail more times than you succeed. Let's be honest. So I don't tie them up, so that means I know lots of them. So I can call on a broad bunch, but I don't have the same ones each time. You used to, you used to have crews that used to stick together more. And they used to, you know, which is great. I wish we could do that, okay. but I can't. I can't honestly tie them up. Or if I go to America or something, not you don't travel with with the whole gang, you know, which is fair enough. And I can't take tea to China. You know, you can't say there are no good American operators. So there are no good American operators. I mean, good Czech ones. I mean, Romanian. I mean, you know, lots of you know, pick up people in the way. Um, if I'm going to do a big picture, I do try and insist on getting. You know, you want know, people that you're going to get in. In the trenches in a storm, and you want people who are steady and calm. Um, yeah. So, you're people, you were born in England. Yeah. But you are a Scotsman. Right. Uh, but you know, I suspect your heart is in Europe in many ways. Yeah. Yeah, I've always felt that. You know, you know, 
especially this sauce here, you know, you want it to be quite a fancy fucking with it, that way it will be, it'll just get so muddy up that people can't do it. And I like to move around, you know, I can't be as a Brexit. You know, I've got, I've got to go home after this because I've run out of days. Because I've been in Europe too long. Why would you go there? Because I like it. <laughs> you fucking worms. <laughs> you know, back to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's tragic. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. I thought, so you want to go over and meet people you want to go to that place. I mean, a lot of studios would have this just day of life in Shift and in Leeds and in you know, Pinewood, you know, right now. They just don't, they're not, you know, producing films now is like, you know, cheap. So this is a few bits of paper, they need so many days, I mean, five stages, six stages, two green screen, the little, little back lot, holiday in, Starbucks, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's just, this is sausage factory type. You know, I was going to get the film now, but it would be with red and stuff, I mean, King Henry gets sort of a dry lugger, a lugger sort of a little bit. We go across that, we can, we can today. What about next week? So the producer will just say, well, I'm build a bridge. I mean, it's creation. Okay. Says, oh, okay. 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 Builds a bridge. And they, they name it off, and the school's thrilled because the school can now go back and support the kids. But that, you know, that he built a bridge. We had stabling for 120 horses. We had, you know, so yeah, that's a producing. There aren't those sort of producers right now. Anywhere. I mean, there's all sub guys, so they would go there, and it was impressive. You'd see them, they just build Jerusalem in the desert. You know. And 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 days of five thousand extras, five thousand days and days of you know, to be fed. And they'd be in hospitals and this that thing. You know. That sort of stuff, it's not you just Drive up to Shepton and up goes the barrier. You can't sort of go in, and sit in your chair, look at the green screen. Oh, this is interesting. There's a man in underpants in front of green blankets flying around on wires. <laughs> this is really different, isn't it? You know, what are we up to? Marvel number thirty now or something? You know. So I mean, you know, that that I didn't get into it, but you know, it was interesting. I was doing something the other day. The years I became interested in filmmaking, in the late 70s, there were, of the top 20 grossing films, all of them were original stories. All of them originalised, apart from one, which was Seabot's already plot up. And since 2010, of the top grossing films, four of them are made by, sorry, 13 of, the, of those top 20 are made by four franchises. That's Marvel. Star Wars. Well, you know, no, no, actually, no. I mean, I'm talking specifically about repeats. So Marvel, it's with, you know, the thing, Star Wars, I think Jurassic, and the Fast and the Furious. I mean, the guy driving out there and pulling on the handbrake, that is, <laughs> that is... That is it, you know. And then of the, third, of the other six, right, that weren't part of those big four, they were all repeats or sequels. And the one original one, do you know what the original film was? Top person? It was Frozen. <laughs> Frozen, which isn't a bad movie, but they ain't gonna get there. <laughs> so, you know, that's a bit of a problem for me right now. I don't, there's not too much excitement. Um, which of your movies had you expected to be do better? Well, I mean, you all think they're gonna do. I mean, I thought um, flashbacks were full and very good shots. Um, it was, a, you know, just this really good coming of the film about. You know, it's, 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 it deflates, it's a good film, it's like um, both beautifully made and uh, full. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good one. Uh, especially with a high-ranging Logan. Logan, well, I did Logan. Yeah, yeah, that's what I did. Yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's funny, because I mean, I did this one like, you know, this year, what came out of the Sierra, uh, Doctor Strange. And it was huge. Huge. I mean, it took, I mean, within, two, within two weeks, it was just short of a billion. 
Because no one learns it. It's gone. It's just gone. I mean, it's just that. You know what I mean? It's just disappeared. I mean, Gladiator didn't just disappear. But they took more money than that. They just... So, I don't know what the... Attention span, social media, I don't know what it is. So some films, I mean, you know, you know, sometimes do well, sometimes don't. I don't know why that is. So, um, sometimes, you know, get legs, get up on the roof, and you know, do no water or things like that. You know, just been on and on and on. So it sometimes become fashionable again. You know, some films get really tired looking really quickly. You know, they they, they look old, um, and some films just just stay there, just, just stay good. You know, just. Um, and you know, that was the thing during lockdown, I watched a lot of it. You know. I mean, I heard of the cinema where we are in Australia. I can't keep that up. Make sure, make them watch films they don't want to watch. But you know, they usually walk away thinking, well, that's a good film. But you know, you know. so, I mean, there's so many great films that are, you know, you, you that's the thing, you know, having a BFI, um, you know, you not much money, it's an institution. UK, just in the middle of London, in the middle. And you can watch films for nothing. Pretty much, and um, you can sit there all afternoon and see a bunch of things that you should have seen, what you've heard about, or you've never seen this in a lot. And that's amazing. And I always used to go there because it was the cheapest cinema. I mean, it was quite near me. I lived in South East London, so just a bus ride. So that's, you know, that's. I know the, the tragic thing is, whatever age we live to, we're never going to see what the great films have made. So it's always my stop. <laughs> Stop making sequels, please. I was, I was in, the, in the cinema in the Cameron Park, watching you know, Queen of Scots. Mm. And uh, as a perfectionist, there was something which you were not happy with, with the end result. I still don't know what it was. Well, that projection. Yeah, it was. I think it was the, it was the wrong thing. Yeah. It was just it wasn't. I mean, it, didn't, it, it had looked a lot better. I mean, we had trouble getting it there, and the Polish distributors that gave us some. Um, it's a strange thing, you know, you, you go to a festival, but from the Polish distributor won't let you show the film because they think you're going to somehow spoil it for the rest of Poland. Um, right. you know, so you, they end up being awkward, so you end up sending us something that just wasn't quite right. Um, but you are a perfectionist, I think. Mm -hmm. Everything you do seems to me perfectly mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that was the thing. When I was thinking about the film, I understood that. I mean, you used to always go to rehearse a film. And quite often, if I was in Paris or wherever it was, and I'd see one of the films running, I'd always creep in the back of the cinema. I'd buy a ticket and say, would you mind if I went in and just looked at And, you know, I have to say, by the end of the big film period, let's say, it's of the, sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, I have to say the quality and Control was absolutely excellent. You could go into some obscure place and, you know, maybe the objection was not perfect, but you'd see no, that, that level of contrast is good, the print is good, it's not too muddy, the blacks are still defined, but they're strong, the colours are great, and I like that. And you just, you just go, you know, I'm glad this is, people are seeing it like this. When the digital objectors came in, everything was very up and down. And when the DIs came in, that took a while to settle down to get the quality back again. But, um, I mean, you still see some very bad projection. I mean, that, that Odeon in, in, in Leicester Square, that short one, it's got a silver screen, which, I mean, they've been banned in France. I mean, it's fucking terrible that people, because they had to do it for the 3D to get the, I mean, how much 3D with jet waves? It's just not really, you know, it's never, it's never been that satisfactory. Yes. Uh, John, John has got some clips, so it's about time I think we saw it. Uh, yeah, yeah, so. Without time. I'll talk through the sound. We did this was something that we found on my laptop at last so week. I have to crack it out. So it wasn't as I wasn't really expecting to come in that way. I'm not really sure exactly what all of it's on that uh, it's in, but um can we switch off that light? So, guys, light. There's one that's on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. 
So this this was actually this this film was shot in the film. Um, don't tell me you see it. Um, no, this is speaking through. Um, so uh, what what was what was can you just switch it off or not? Okay. Yeah. Um, so you know. Um, Lots of colour, you know, which I didn't have to worry about because I mean, I know this is a digital motion, but that's not my laptop, but it's a very colourful film. Um, and um, it was great to be able to do that and not worry about a digital camera freaking out with certain saturations and, um, you know, noisy blues, essentially getting slightly noisier here, it was just nice but, but the thank you. Um, but uh, you know that that was a, that was a, um, uh, a fun thing to do, and this this is this is a heavy CG film. But unlike many CG films, we actually shot in real places. So the CG element is just foreground, whether it's Pikachu or this mad monkey thing that's been smoking. Um, yeah, we had. Uh, no, really. Um, so, so what was good for us was that we could actually really like the sets. We didn't, we weren't doing green screen. So the, when the foreground element is small, um, it's a bit like those kind of music, a few, quite a few years ago called Jessica Rabbit. So, so this, this, this is my dog. He stood in for Pikachu. This, this is the Pikachu. So these are the guys who stick in front of the camera and then, you know, they animated them. That's, that's the furry one. That's the expensive one they made to get the fur passes right. And then, um, but you know, we had this animated guy with these guys who would run around a uh, Frenchman in, in a sort of green gimp suit. Now, you know, there's this nice young American fellow trying to act and he's looking at a, a middle-aged man in a gimp suit, which is not an attractive look, usually staring at his nuts because that's where Pikachu's eyes were. Mm -hmm. And we weren't really getting the performance. So, so, it, so here's the bridge and stuff. So, you, so I, we use my dog. <laughs> so he he and so to look at camera with the camera and so we go and walk that way. So we we use the dog a lot, but, um, and and the Japanese were quite excited about that. They uh, they liked him because he had big eyes. Um, so this is obviously this is massive CG, massive CG stuff. But we had big big effects department. And they wanted to do a lot of these things for real. I mean they weren't slightly over the top of this, but they, we actually made a. Uh, I mean look at this. It's a, you can see this. It's a massive. Um, rostrum with, with hydraulic rams that lifted up um lifted up the, the actors so um they 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 actually ran up with this thing um, and and had to hang on for dear life um see that thing but it's they, they, they filmed this all up in scotland um you know these scott scots pines the elements then they built a lot back in back lot of shepperton and there it is without trees, so they just run down there and they lift the floor up. And um, that scared the crap out of them. Actually, Catherine's a lot braver than Justice, so she would always um, outdo him. I mean, she actually she actually plays scratch golf. She plays, I just want her to play golf against Donald Trump. She, um, she's, uh, but it's a little stunties. But anyway, a lot of this this was quite good for us. This and a lot of physical effects, and even though yes, it's a considered a big, big CG film, you know, it's great to do real, real things like this. Um, and uh, you know, you shadow shift and everything works. Of course, it's been supplemented a lot, as you saw, and I think they went slightly over the top. Um, in in, uh, they kind of made it too big. In the CG, which there was tins of, I think they made it smaller. I think it would have felt more physical, which I mean, it undoubtedly is. I think those guys are, and some sort of 10 meters up off the, up off the ground there. Um, so, anyway, so we shot it on film, um, you know, real locations. Uh, we did go to studios a bit, but it was great to be out and about and to go to, like, we, we, we did some of this at the Roundhouse in Canada. And some again, um, so you know, we, you, you know, it's very much so going back to sort of almost this was like doing a, a live performance rock and roll day, so rock and roll nights, and Pikachu running around. My dog didn't do this much stuff, I didn't do that. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> what I can say about it. Um, does anyone want to know any questions about Pikachu? <laughs> I liked him. We were gonna we were gonna shoot again, um, but uh, Donald Trump fell out with um, the Chinese, and he went to this trade war that he was gonna win. And um, legendary Chinese, they just said, "Right, fuck you. We're not gonna invest in um, in another film." So we didn't make another one. But anyway. I think everyone would have liked to, to make another one. I mean, I'm not a great fan of sequels, but um, uh, you know, was this, I think, okay, there's the stun with the, the whippy whippy thing. Um, to you know, guys in gin suits. Um, so you know, so this is what the, the you know, poor justice had to look at this guy on the left there with a lot of rum. Um, middle-aged man in suits. Anyway, here we are in um, X-Men First Class and um, it's Chris Corbold taking them through what they're going to do in the X-Jet, which was, uh, you know, built full-scale at um, Leavesden and we'd spun them around and made them throw up and, um, well, he went through up, it was, uh, that was that guy again. Um, uh, so this film was a disaster, really. I mean, it went 60 million over, if that's possible. Um, but anyway, it was a big success, so everyone's forgiven. Um, I I got the credit for it because apparently I shot more than anybody else. But I think I, at one moment I had seven units, not seven clones, seven units. So, um, you know, I had a flying unit, I was less I had a nautical, I had an aerial, another, um, another nautical marine unit, um, a wire unit, second and third units, and it was, I mean, you know, some, some of the units would come to me, what are we doing today? And I'd say, oh, you know, the way in, you would see that, you know, the old crab shack, you know, where Spongebob goes, that's the thing worked out in Georgia. I said, yeah, you, you see that place? Yeah, you go there. And then, uh, you know, you, you, you stay there for a bit. So, okay, and then you'll bring me up the, the, the John was still here. I said, yeah, just order some crab patties, eat them, drink some beer and go home. Because um, I just, I know we had so much uh, d d disorder. I mean, it really was the most chaotic shoot. But anyway, the film turned out really good. I don't know why, you know. Um, and these guys all stuck to it and they were great. And of course, what they did was, what they were trying to do is reboot the franchise because they were paying Hugh Jackman, Halle Berry, Patrick Stewart too much money. So they get a bunch of kids in, Jennifer Lawrence, unknown, James McAvoy, unknown, Michael Fassman, unknown, who eventually then went, they went off and won Oscars and eventually the prices went back up again. So they were again painting, um, you know, paying so much for it. Anyway, here we are blowing, blowing gas and stuff up their noses. Um, and this was again, uh, the, this, uh, this set was on a spit roast rolling around and uh, chucking him out. And then the old wire guys, incredible, they actually flew these guys with cameras around them um, up in the air. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't up on stage. And uh, you'd hear the actors scream because they said they'd do it and then they'd hook them you know, 30 meters up in the air and shoot them around the place. Um, yeah, I know, it was. It was well, the safety aspect of it was amazing, but they, they, they were all very happy to do it. And, and the, the wire guys were great, the Australians and South Africans are very um, sure about what they did. But, you know, but anyway, they, you know, so we put the camera behind them on a bogey on a wire camera, and they would fly in the camera, be just on fog, and they'd be the same thing and shoot them all down together. So you know, this was made in Georgia in the middle of winter, and um, Anyway, it, 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 it was a stylish film, you know, taking it back to the 60s was, I think, a good thing. Cause it, it was, I think everything in the 60s had a sort of chicness to it, which doesn't seem to be what I know. But anyway, that was, um, I think, one of the better X, one of us. 
and then these, these guys, I mean, you know, they just didn't know, know what was going on. They had no idea. We just turned up and, you know, they had no idea of the script. We're not, not what we're doing. And then just look out the window and there's something over there. Yeah. And they didn't know what they were looking at. Like some treasure island or they've just arrived outside New York or, oh, there's a submarine that's, what, submarine's in the air? Yeah, the submarine's in the air. Oh, okay. Okay, just tell me where you want to look. You know, submarine's in the air. But submarine's not in the sea. No, submarine's in the sea. So I mean, Michael was saying, you can just see some, what the fuck am I doing here? You can see it behind his eyes. This guy's great, he never said anything. He was like some fashion model. He just did that. I don't think he even spoke to one set. <laughs> my, my God, Nick James, and these are all really good actors. Nicholas Holt inside there. Bless him, we, you know, lovely English fellow. Now I was getting into my private, but. And, uh, oh yeah, anyway, this we shot in, it was brutal winter, it was supposed to be the Caribbean, and they, they brought in 300 or more palm trees in skips, and you see they all look a bit dead, they all died. And I turned up one morning after drinking moonshine, you know, don't drink moonshine, it's worse than any shiva bits, anything you ever have. <laughs> and I, I was so fucking hungover, I've had to work seven days a week, and I thought, oh God, my eyes have gone, the sand had gone green. And I felt green through and through. And then I, I noticed uh, someone walked across the sand. They left white sand prints where their feet had been, like fresh. And I thought, oh, fuck. And what they'd been doing overnight was spraying the palm trees, but the palm trees had all died. So they had to spray them green again. And all the green painted on the sand made the sand green. So I'm going to sweep the sand up and make it less green. <laughs> and as James is fancy split, he was eating too many burgers. <laughs> That's another stuffy. I mean, here we are, look at this. I mean, they're the dying trees, and this is the reality. I mean, it's all bastard to life because look at the conditions. Yeah, I know, I really don't match this. It's awful. I mean, look at that cloudy day. I mean, everyone's was wrapped up, they were freezing cold. Um, and all the dead palm trees, oh, they, they can see them dry. So it was a really difficult job. And there's the green plate, you see. That, um, it was very difficult to, to match that sequence, to get it right. Um, you know, technically difficult. And you don't get any thanks for doing that. It's only your best work you do. It just disappears into making things look okay. You know, but you have to know what that is. And it, this, these were all on film, so there was no digital reference or anything to look up. Or you had to sort of remember in yourself and write notes and how to, you know, tried as best you could to remember. So here we are, this is a hundred and, um, so we took 40 horses from the UK, and I think we had two, um, I think it was 120, from the King of Morocco, there was two cavalry detachments um, from his guys, um, but we never got that many horses out because they were horses were, the desert's hard on them, they, they're hard on their feet, hard on their eyes, they get a lot of uh, eye infections. But this was a good old, Cavalry charge, and um, yeah, you know, you're sitting there behind the railway sleepers with a camera, and you're seeing 120 horses coming out. You need to think, I now know what cavalry was for. It was terrifying, and the noise alone is fantastic. Um, so, this is obviously supplemented. Those are the real guys, but that's obviously added to. The, the castles are real. We built not not the top part. The castles are really built those. Um, those we doubled the other side is actually Jerusalem. Um, so there's there's quite a lot of CG work there, but this is all real. This is all you know. See the camera juddering. We didn't have the stabilized heads then, but I think it looks better when it's not stabilized. I think it's got energy and smashing this first exchange was just <laughs> absolutely brutal. I mean, people just flying in the air, describing it, stand top, watch. Um, I think he gets trauma. Anyway, and then Orlando, yeah, we put him into it, middle of it, to be quite careful, of course, because, you know, when you do bring a horse down, the people are spotting the horse, so it doesn't jump up and kick, but if you're an actor very close to it. Um, and Orlando, we had to get him a shorter and shorter sword because he kept chopping people's legs off and stuff. So if you look at it, he's fighting with a really short sword by the end of this, because he kept um, swinging it and knocking <laughs> And they're really saying, oh, he really sold that, uh, he really sold that blow. I said, yes, really, that guy came to the hospital. He's got a fucking very slash across his chest. But anyway, look, you look great, all the mud and dust and, well, handheld cameras. Well, not, well, just with zooms on, actually, because it, 
you've got two handheld cameras and you can't get the others nearby because they'll be wearing short lenses. So we tend to step back a bit, which of course gives you that lovely depth and all the dust picks up and the atmosphere picks up on all and all the crap and the blood and all the things they're throwing in the air. But anyway, so we were there, I was, I mean, talking about being away a long time with non-opera, so I was away for 144 days on this job. It was, it was a, um, yeah, it was a monster. Um, I think, you know, easily the biggest film, easily the biggest film I've ever made. I was worried about that making up the budget-wise, but it's certainly value for money. This, this film looks incredible. So this fellow to the right, he's, uh, he's from uh, Croatia. Vilibor um, mm-hmm. But anyway, you know, this film, I, this film I hope would be more successful than it was. You know, I, you know it wasn't, it didn't do the famous uh, thing. Anyway, here's the famous uh, Alan um, Weefield, um, not Russell. Um, he was actually a he was a stuntman, and he just did this very beautiful thing. This hat, I don't know why he did it. He just sort of plays like a piano. And um, yeah, this is a great Ridley cut. This is a great cut. I'm not saying it's great cinematography. It's not it's great editing. So it's the hand in the wheat field cut to a close up of Sun's face. This is the way to introduce Sun. Something is going to happen to this man. He's trying to get back to where he's coming from. Look, he's coming to consciousness all the time. He wakes up, wakes up, and there's a little bit of a connection back to the other world, the Robin. But there he is. He is somewhere. He, he, he doesn't want to be. He's in this hellish place, away from home, in the edge of the world, the edge of the, beyond the edge of the known world. And look, this where he is. So, you know, a great introduction. And that, everyone is. Um, that's not, that's, I mean, English and then all this tradition, this writing, all this stuff like that. It's nothing to do with that. That's just really good filmmaking. There's no script, no dialogue, nothing. They're just cuts. You can't write that. You don't say, oh, there's a hand in the wheat field dancing on the thing. It's all gorgeous and beautiful. He's in Tuscany. Cut to a close up of some bloke. That doesn't actually work. You know, you've got to actually see that. So, so this warm, beautiful, you know, burnt biscuit hanging in a summer evening, late autumn, late summer, hand going through a wheat field cut to this haggard, weathered, tired looking eyes in a very cold place. That is a great way to introduce someone. That's that's just pure editing. It's not cinematography. And it's really good directing. And that's what Ridley's good at. And you know, he was lampooned you know, for his for all the things he did, you know, people weren't very kind to him. They, you know, he makes commercials, he doesn't know what he's doing. Well he didn't study English at Oxford. Well so fucking what? What's that got to do with anything? Now, people here understand that. Everyone understands that shot. There's no Chaucer, no Shakespeare, no Milton, nothing. I was thinking, kind of funny, if, if Shakespeare came back now, and, you know, you could you used to go to listen to a play, you listened to, to a play, you didn't watch it, you listened to a play. And you say, hey, Will, we've got these things called cameras, right? And you could actually make The Merchant and Venice in Venice. Well, oh, fuck me, that's good. Let's go to Venice, then. And then someone would tear these pages up. That's actually, you just use the camera to tell the story. So I'd be quite interested if Mr. Shakespeare would come back. What's the film I make? He'd be, I think he'd be a, a very good one. Um, anyway, he's got a headache. Let's go back. Uh, yeah, what's that? Is that that? That looks like that. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not very good. He's Scottish. <laughs> Timothy Jones. Yeah, so this was all just outside um, England. Yeah, it's down far, it's just outside the It's not actually far from Shepton. And we got a really good winter. They bought forestry, uh, you know, it's pretty cheap, actually, about 25 pounds a tree. They hadn't grown that well, and they just dug it all out. And we didn't make it look like a Roman battlefield, but it would have been a battlefield that would have been most extra to nice green field or something. They, they churned it up, left that Ridley thing. He made it look like. Um, Maybe it looked like, uh, first of all, a war battlefield. So by association, you think it's a war, you think it's um, a battlefield. But in fact, what he's, what he's borrowing from it is no man's land, the first of all, upturned trees, mud, filth. And you get the feeling that these guys have been there for a long time. And that's just, um, you know, that's just not a direction. But it's very much his stamp on it.
I'm just wondering if there's one or two similar traumas which I hear have been quite honoured to have been sacked. Have you ever been sacked? Yeah, I was sacked by the BBC. Weird. But then the film that I got sacked already, one of the others in the entire department. No, I was just freelance. So it was the time they were breaking down. There was a there was a there was a bit of guy who was about to go to court. It was holding down the day court and he was going to go to court. And if in fact he'd gone down on Monday, then they wouldn't have had a film. So this friend of mine said, Can you get a camera? Can I get this camera? So we started shooting on Thursday because we need to to prove everything as well. I mean, the court, he's going to go to court, whatever happens. So we're not going to wait for you. So he'd start his preliminary work. He didn't like the guys he was using. So we shot for five days. And then he didn't go to prison, so he carried on for another week and a half. And then they fired me, they fired the sound, they fired us all in the end because we were going to see people. And then they um, in the film won the awards. And then Mark Munden was a great filmmaker. Um, he was furious, but then they tried to rehire us. As, but I mean, I wasn't, um, uh, not that I, I, I didn't really want to, to, I wasn't working for Mark. I didn't want to work for the BBC, especially. Well, I did like the BBC, but they did, but I didn't. I was more interested in doing dramas and you know, I met Derek John by that stage and we were making music videos and I just thought they could have more um, broader ideas and more opportunity and, you know running around with you know Derek and his boys and stuff than actually going to stuff like Harris Street Jackets and something like that. Um, one of your films I know because I can't remember which one it is uh, that was your film. It is a kind of co shared credits with Seamus. Yeah. I just wondered about the relationship you had in, in, uh, in the making of that film, a coordination, a discussion. Well, I mean, Seamus was doing a prayer, um, and then he had this sort of, um, you know, his baby was born, there was a crisis, and he was going to deal with that. So he, he'd done a sermon prayer. But he just he just had to go, um, so he wasn't really available to me. There wasn't really a sort of a hand over. He just he really just left. Well, he left, and then they hired me. That's that's the order of having to. And I came and I spoke to him. Spoke, but then immediately I had to go and see sets and things. They were doing this film plan, taking this studio up in um, Bedfordshire, Cardington, which is an old Zeppelin one. Chris Nolan likes it. It's about one hundred eighty feet. It's it's um, it's off. It's um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, was it, 16 letters or something to the ceiling. And it's absolutely enormous. And so I went in, and was put some lights in it, and double the lighting, double the rigging. But, because, you know, the space lights had to work really hard to come down that deep. So he said, What are you doing? What are you doing? He said, Getting crazy. I said, Shingles, you just get a small stage. You know? Anyway, we built a jungle in there. The trees were so big that they put 12 trees in. They said, Crazy. But anyway, they built this wonderful sort of imaginary set for Peter Pan. Um, and um, so I had to do all that, and then I shot the. It, it kind of divided quite well because I shot the, the the stuff where Peter Pan is in London before he gets kidnapped and flies away to Neverland. Um, so um, so it, it it was there was a break there, but then we came back and we we sort of talked. And I showed what I'd done and blah blah blah. I mean, but really, you know. Um, you know, a film like that, you have to put prep and light so much, and you know, I mean, he could he could change things a bit, but I mean, really, you know, those stages are massive, and you have to, but you know, it's like you have to get the rigging, and almost probably get the sets, and you know, taking rigs or whatever that's going up around the sets, and there's lights being pulled up into the weekends, and there's all part work, so so much of it had to be done by me, and you know, he had to sort of roll with it, like it. I, mean, I don't think he didn't, I don't think there's anything he didn't not like, but I did tell him what we were doing, and then he took over, and then did the more fantasy parts so they were really well and we had the same gaffer which was good so they knew they, they knew the crew obviously knew what they knew so we, but, it, but it was a sort of um you know it worked well but it was an emergency situation i wouldn't say it was um, um well we haven't talked about gaffers at all mm. uh do anything you'd like to say about uh, yeah i mean they're very um 
I mean, I was always thought, just get people who have more experience than you. I was thought, yeah, you can get the best you possibly can. Trying to seduce them, trying to get them to work is the problem. Because, you know, you're not going to get, you maybe you're not going to have the budgets that they're used to for them and their crew. They'll want their crew, they'll want their, you know, I mean, as good as they are. And they'll want their, they're as good as their crew. So, you know, will they be able to hire their people? And, you know, um, over the years, yeah, I've managed to do that and also managed to take them onto smaller things too because they know that we're about to back onto something bigger. And so they'll be paid and come around. But no, they're very important. Um, because in these big films, you don't, you know, the finessing and stuff comes on the floor. You know, the, the big heavy stuff, that happens weeks before. So you, you better be clear about what it is. You can't just sort of turn up and go, oh, I don't like that over there, let's move that. You know, that's that you, so, you know, good gaffers, you know, if they, they're working something tricky, you know, I've got a few more things in there you probably need. But, um, but ultimately, you, you know, you're going to put in, you know, these big sets of things like that, pan, or this big Doctor Strange thing we did, which were, you know, big builds, big sets, you, they're going to get hit back by production. So they can't have too much fat, too much stuff lying around. Um, and then, of course, the schedules changed, so all that stuff that you were going to tear down and move across to there, and they didn't finish in that stage, and I just coming back. So you get caught out. With, so a good, a good gap open, they might go, well, I'm improvise that, well, I think I smell a rat here. I think we're going to get in trouble, because if we didn't finish that sequence, that means we're not going to get back there next week, because next week we have to be there, and so the so week after, therefore, we're going to ask for more equipment. So that, that's, that's the sort of stuff that you are aware of, but you don't actually see coming. And that's what good gaffers do. They go in, they beat up the production managers and say, "This, you're going to be in trouble next week if we do not address this." Really. So, but you know, I like, I like. Um, I mean, you, they get used to you and you do certain things. And stuff. I like to think the films look different. You know, I like to think Pikachu looks different to Kingdom Heavens, which looks different to Gladiator. You know, I like to like to think don't do the same thing, but the same lines, the same stuff, the same gels. You know, you do find yourself doing the same thing I suppose we all do but the you, you I think to brief yourself to whatever so um so you know yeah they're always on you like we need a list of that are you sure about this do you want to, what are these gels we don't use these gels you know do you want to use these ones use this last time do you want to use them again because it feels different well I mean I was thinking of something different because it is different so yeah you 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 but you appreciate their crew and and because you know you can't you know when, when these films like king of heaven was big days cost but so you know you can't be waiting you can't so they've got to be but they've got to be mustard they can't I hate waiting or hate feeling that they're waiting for me or something, you know. I mean, but I know that a lot of people carry a lot of stuff. I went to do a commercial the other day. It was a head and oh, some of them COVID, I was Judy Kate Marshall. And it was a, and they had 120 sky patterns. I was like, what the fuck are these for? So eighty five percent of the writing is this you should because you like you. It was really up, but you know, well, just the loading on unloading and putting the stuff on the floor. Just to do that would have been a day of just labour, just putting it on the floor to be a nice machine. So um, I, I like to think I'm quite frugal. I mean, of course, the big set's a big set, or maybe a small set, but I, mean, I did put a thousand parkings up on the last movie, and that's a lot of units, but they only cost two pounds each. Well, a sky panel costs, I don't know what it costs, but two pounds a day is not, and they don't give a shit if you drop them or smash them. You know, in bulb, but if you drop in the bulb, that constantly. So, so that saves money. Of course, but they require more power, but they're not on all the time. So, with sky panels, you tend to leave on all the time. As a cinematographer who doesn't mostly operate today, what is your relationship with the actors? Because obviously, if you are operating, a lot of people find that they have a closer relationship with the actors, mm. but that detracts very often from the, from the director's relationship. The director gets fearful of the times. Yeah. I mean, the answer is you get certain, you know, actors. Do you find that the 
try to try to do them to become friendly with them. Like, yeah, I think you've got to be. I mean, yeah, you've got to try and be. Yeah, you know, I mean, you've got to be long term with anyone. You hopefully, all friends by the end of it. Got to be really. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm always near the camera. I don't. I don't spend hours in the tent. I tend to stand near the camera so they can, if they need to catch my eye about something or, or that I'm doing. You know, don't, you know, give them little things like that, um, especially with the vegans and that. They've also got to look fabulous all the time. It may change, I think, change that much. So, um, yeah, and I'm not that far away. And I think they like, I mean, a lot of directors now are very much in the tent and, you know, talking through it is horrible, you know, talking through the radio. So they feel a bit, so I think it's quite nice if they have someone senior on, you know, someone they can catch the line. And I can go back, you know, and say, well, you know, we want to talk to you. But, so, it, yeah, I mean, it's important to to get on with them because then you've got to shape them and make them look good, uh, wicked something um, and then they sometimes look and I'm that okay you know it's, it's not my job to say it's okay but you can look, you know reassure them and smile and, you know um, yeah it's not and also you know to then not let them burn you know because the only one comes out and says guys come in for that don't worry you know, winding yourself up don't, or they can't they're struggling with a line or a prop I said oh, we can get that it's fine, just, just like, get from there to there, and we'll detail that, and relax, and get the lines that get flowing. So that, that helps, I think. Um, and I don't know, a lot of people, they might shoot multiple cameras and want it all at one time, you can shoot. Everyone's got a shot, and no one's got the shot. So you might well, just rest those, or, or, you know, just say, leave one of the cameras to say, look, just, just then do the whole thing, just try and get that insert so it doesn't feel like an insert and come back for it. So we pick it up a bit in the flow of the action so it's smooth with the cut, the direct, so the editor has it as a continuous movement, it's a soft cut to move through, rather than just film everything, what everyone does. So that's, so that's sort of being on the floor, which I don't know, is the answer to your question, but it's sort of staying with what's happening with, on the floor with, with the talent, you know. Um, and I think it's respectful because I said a lot of this sort of stuff coming out over the loud halo. So, you know, it's like having a domestic, literally to a domestic argument in public. You think, well, then should we just leave the room? You know, and they don't. They shout with one of these things. And um, that's not. That's not. So, you know, I think we've lost the time with some of you asked some questions, please. But uh, some has not been mentioned at all in this discussion. Of it. Perhaps has anybody got a sound question? Yeah. 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 We saw Dennis before that. Yeah. Hang on, we got the door. Yes. Ah, oh. first of all, thank you again, John Cameron, and the recipients of this. Yes, John Cameron. You've been here, you remember? Yeah. We have it. Almost seven degrees. And then I ask you, when I will just get the <coughs> connection with the big budget films, ready and the uh, last thing that I see. And uh, let's say, army of, of the collaborators, especially with visual effects, they cannot count the number of credits. It's almost a uh, thousand with Logan and last one covered by the Working with uh, Ridley Scott, Gladiator, uh, Sam Raimi, this uh, uh, kind of that shit, and uh, Logan, Mango, and on the other side, the sort of small fuse, I selected them. And we were very curious which were those two films I I selected. They passed by the circuit. Uh, we got so it's very interesting to to tell me since 
the position of cinematographer is the figure general conductor of the visual structure expression of the screen. There will be the, 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 the visual effects. What, what is how do we feel about that to just control the machine? So the, the question is to how do I feel about controlling the visual yeah, effects? Yeah, the visual effects and visual effects. Well, I suppose. Well, great technology. Well, I don't really do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I try not to let them run away with it. Because, you know, now, because Gladiator was only 50 shots. Yeah, which is, that's all they kept budget for. I mean, I think it probably ended up with 50 shots. So the average film now is small film, 800. <laughs> film. I mean, kind of strange, a couple of thousand. So, there, you know, there wasn't too much to worry about. And you knew when they were going to come, you knew the elements. And nothing, they, they, those things haven't changed. You know, they are, I don't know how you do a shot, green screen, that has not changed, really, basic. You know, the, and, and, and the level of people do them at. You know, the first Matrix is one of the best Matrix, because they actually did it properly. And then the later ones, it fell apart again. Or with this new, I don't know, the dusty digital people, all this like shit. And it ages really quickly. So, so uh, it wasn't too difficult then the film well, after that glad uh, the phantom of the opera was six shots then we did king heaven i think that was 800 so it went up so but what you try and do when you're working more with i mean it's special effects and visual effects and you know, it's not for those guys because they're the ones who really do the front end of it i mean they we the last bond films that, you know it's the more they do the better it looks the more that the the rider rides the bike, the explosion he falls off the horse, he really hits the ground, the better it is. They can embellish things. And I think most visual effects, people will tell you that. They, they would prefer it if you do that. So I try to, you know, do them as best I can because, you know, when, when you do these big films and they, they get them, they bring it in and they go up and, and then a lot of visual effects come in very late and they work very long hours and you can tell they just don't sit. So anything Anything that I do with them, I mean, it might be a pain in the ass, it might be a brute, or it might be, I really try to do with them as best as we possibly can so that it, 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 it works, you know, and they can be a bit shy and they don't really make their mind up. And I try and give them space, don't tell you anyone to love them, you know, but I can only hold them back for so long. What do you want? Are you want to scream at me? You should have said something earlier. Like, well, go to look after them. Get them right so you try and, because it's still, you know, it's fun, it's still your film. You know? Their film, your film, Brett's film, so still wanted to look great. So you don't, you don't want to say, oh, well, the bit of effects are good. You just, you, you don't want to notice. I think when you watch the cinema, you don't want to notice the cinematography. You don't want to notice the visual effects. You just want to be in the film. You know, that's what it works. When you don't achieve it, it's the frames and then you just go inside the screen and, and the lights come back on. You think, oh, who I am, and pick my stuff. And, and, and that's when the films work. So, so it's got to work. The internet has got to work. You've got to make them as good as they can be. Um, and they say working with special effects to make those things as best as you possibly can. You know, um, I mean, I've noticed that's gone down and down. You know, when they built the X Jet and rolled it round, you know, the gladiators we really built, you know, fired horses and chariots in the air, and you know, King Henry smashed walls down the little model. Water Jerusalem tries this, smashed that up. And, Beautiful models, and so you know all of those things. They were helped by visual effects, so yeah. and I think the film, like I said, the Sigma Third Matrix, that look, they look tired and old very quickly, can be let down. Gladiator still looks good because it. Well, that's one or two visual effects. Demo. A lot of really physical stuff, and that's and that's what keeps it going. So, so I think as a cinematographer, you've got to, you know, create the space and help them as much as you possibly can to make it as good as they possibly can be. Um, for that, um, and you know, as I said, even on the plane, there were massive reshoots on um, Doctor Strange, and some uh, there's this whole section of thank god it's called the multiverse of madness or something because there's a halfway through it, there's looks like a Korean air freshener commercial goes on. It's like, what, hang on, hang on, what the fuck is this? It's flowers and it's all fluffy and it looks like a soap, soap commercial. I don't know, James. You know, sort of, you know, sound was rolling his eyes and so on, that's what they wanted. And then, you know, multiverse of madness, so we just said, no, it's okay, it could be like that. But it wasn't great, 
And you know, even the first guy, he was sucking through his teeth. He didn't like it, but he, they threw it in the last minute. It was a script fix, which I don't think it needed. Um, so that was a classic thing of like, here's a big film, here's what's funny, and here's a real problem there, because it wasn't done properly. Um, but, you know, as I said, luckily it's called the Multiverse of Meat Salad. You more like dog's dinner. <laughs> Any more? Yeah. Um, so, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, I have three questions, but I'm going to try to fit them all in one. Uh, first of all, Nigel said that you're our perfectionist. So, how do these different nervous that you now operate? How do you know the camera operator gets the right thing in the shot? Also, uh, you, uh, what's your opinion on uh, Logan? But I think, or maybe all of us know that Logan is kind of different from all the other superhero movies. It's, there's something that I think uh, is apart from the other one and makes it like a, a, a more like a new investment. And... Uh, the other question was, I, I have a struggle myself, uh, thinking why, uh, gaffers, I think, know maybe more than cinematographers about life, and why, and what do you think, why gaffers aren't becoming cinematographers? And I think they know more of what... Well, I mean, in America, well, I'm going backwards from your questions, in America, a lot of, I mean, so, it's just like, why, why do gaffers not become cinematographers? A lot of them do. A lot of them, you know, a lot of them, um, you know, in, in the UK too, a lot of them, you know, they're not, maybe they're electricians, maybe they're not very long, but a lot of them do. I mean, it, it, it's more in America, certainly it used to be, I'm not sure about now, because you, know, you can go to a, a store, pick up a 4K camera, for, you know, that's impossible. You know, the cameras cost more than cars. You can just get them, get the camera. So, so maybe it's different now. So you can get a better buy a camera, start shooting straight away and switch on a few lights and can so fast, you know. So the gaffers aren't necessary when you are trying to be a young filmmaker. But traditionally in America, yes, you you know, whereas in Britain people came usually through the camera department, became directors of photography, not running a camera's really anything to do with lighting at all. Nothing. Really. I mean, you stand in the same room, but it's nothing to do with um, understanding lights and understanding when your camera's making weird picking moves. All to do with you know exposures and Kodak and blah blah blah, but um, so the, the gaffers would come through the electrical department. You know, we wear the gels. You know, like why are we using a really big light today? Oh, anyway, need small punch. So that that is it, that is not true. That, that there are um, gaffers that come from that. What what used to hold them up was the mystery of film. You know. It's a great thing to understand big lights and gels and color temperature, and you can you have meters that help to understand the temperature. Now you can see it a lot more apparently with your monitors. So you know they they use gels and trims, and they'd understand lights, and they but they could actually tell by by looking at them more than you could as a DP that something was slightly off with the light, color wise. So and also just sometimes the reflectors would go and blah blah blah, and they could tell power surges and all that stuff. So you know that that sounds what. What stopped a lot of them, I think, was the actual mystery of the film. The, the, you know, the dark art of Tom Trick. You know, it's almost like the old guy with the box cap, the blanket over his head, but the magician. Oh, that was too much for a lot of people. Um, and it's difficult. You, know, it's not, you, know, it's, you get that wrong, it's like you're fine, you're gone. You know. So that was a bit of a risk. So, so that's that question answered. I think then going back to Logan, Logan was, I mean, Logan was different. Yeah, I mean, Logan was, you know, it's about a man, it's about a man who's washed up, he's played out, he's, he's, he's done. He's, 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 he's haunted by the death of his wife, his girlfriend. He, he doesn't want to do it anymore. He's, a, he's, he's losing his power, he's, he's drunk. It's, it, for me, it was, I mean, they said it was a, um, uh, I mean, I was making a road movie, I was great. I was making a road movie, it's like an easy road, or Western. And I mean, I, I didn't do it. I didn't want to do the film because I've even made X-Men and all that. And this producer came and said, get out, come out, meet James. We're going to do Wolverine. Okay, Wolverine. Oh, God. 
And I said, well, you know, what are you saying? That's what I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's all swing the script. So what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. You didn't read it. Seriously. You didn't read it. Read it. You didn't read it. Okay, I remember. So I read it and they kill him. I said, I can kill a superhero. I can kill it. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of one of the bastards. Yeah, this is great. They end with superheroes. So I said, right, well, see, I'll do it. So I go out and meet Magdal and they say, yeah, okay, fine, I'll sign up. And then we started talking about it. And he just said right at the beginning, he had something written on a t shirt like, you know, if someone throws someone out a window when they land on the fucking road, that's really bad. They don't get up, they don't bounce around. So he wanted something more. more. Um, it, it's quite a violent film because, not because it, there's people that thrown through walls and stuff, but when they fall down, they don't get up, they die. You know, they kill people. When the other ones, everyone just bounces up again. What's the night? just kill lots of bad guys. You know, so that's what made it more hard. That's for me, it made it more like a, an outlaw film, a Western, a traditional American road movie. You know, I didn't want to make it look too guy around. It's toxic, it's dark, it's all yellow. And, you know, the desert wasn't beautiful, like King Land, beautiful, sandy. It was burnt out, it was you know, hot, nasty. Not a glamorous film. He looked tired and old. Yeah. So, then going back to what you, what was your previous one about the... The camera operator, yeah, perfection of most things perfection. I mean, Sal Tatino thinks you know, he quite likes my film because he thinks they're a bit crap and rough at the edges. So it's using the old perfections. But anyway, so no, but I think that was what I was saying earlier. You've got to be able to communicate to your opera. If you can't do that, you've got no business making films. This is not you painting a picture that you're going to hang in a gallery and someone's going to write about it. You know, this is this is mass communication of an idea. If you can't impart that to the operator and say, well, you would slow through there or pick that up or give it some negative space or reach for that shot when it's uh, you you know you you no good. You know, you, you think, oh, I'm the only one who can operate. You know, I just don't believe that. You've got to be able, you know, the director's telling you, the actor's telling you, you've got to be able to understand. What that is, and of course you could hours with talk about location. Should it be more this or that? Should we go forward on the thirty-five or back on the forty? Let's do, do both. No, we're not going to do both. We're going to do one. You're going to commit. Not everything's fantastic, and um, not everything's perfect. No, I mean you just you know I come up with so many ideas for a film, and so many ideas on script, and you're like, what about this? What about that? Most of them get disregarded or shot down. And the director might pick up on a couple of them. And then we go, well, not exactly what I had in mind, but it's now their idea. And, oh, yeah, not the right here. But at least it gets through. So you just got to come up with, not swamp them with ideas, but I think it's important to insist on certain things and transitions when we move from one to another or something like that. You know, I remember sitting outside Ridley's on Boxing Day and we saw we were sitting outside his place and um, Tony was going for a run. They'd had a terrible Christmas all the fucking infighting the family and I was sitting with him and he said don't ever get married don't ever do this don't ever do that I said really so what's it I said I had a baby two two days ago you fucking and we looked out the window and we saw Robin bouncing around outside on his box edges in the top of the sky and then we just, and that's where it was I said we've well, looked at it well, that's so he was a little brave little bird jumping around so that you know so that's an idea, you know, he took and then, the, you know, the hand in the weed field. I went up and did that because, you know, I'd seen Ridley's films. I said, well, what have you been doing? He'd had a really bad knee, he couldn't walk. And I'd been up with the German steady climb up to come and speak and walking out one of those things that keeps the sun out of the, um, you know, the window. I was blowing a corn and he was walking and he was, Stuart was doing a strange thing. It wasn't in Russell. What do you mean, doing? Well, we filmed that. What's he doing out there? Well, he's, He's a farm, he's touching his weed. Oh, yeah. What was it like? Oh, I forgot about the shot, but it's where the shot goes in. And the robin and the shot, which could have been forgotten, and then the close up of his eyes. So, you know, you throw enough ideas at things. Now, the editor or Ridley put it together like that, but that's what make, that's what kicks that film off. And you meet Maximus and think, this guy is damned from the beginning. He's always trying to get home. He gets home, he's dead. But that's you see him at the beginning. That's the most sort of haunting thing. That's his hand when he's dead. He's walking back into Elise. 
So that I think is so that's that's not written down. That's an instinctive filmmaker. If you ask really what he, why he's doing this shit, he wouldn't be able to tell you. He just doesn't. So you're trying to get into whatever that thing is. It's not interaction. It's just in the group. And I think it's what you know, the, like the thing, it's what musicians do. Yeah. So um so going back to operating professional, no, I think you've got to be able to tell people what what's exactly what they should be doing. I mean not and let them be. And then you you, you all you can do is throw it out there. You know, well, see. Just you do it now. And you've got to give people the ability to I used to do a lot and the reason why that Pikachu thing is so pearled and stuff. With print stuff, when it's used those colours on prints concerts. He was an incredible musician, as we all know, but he would inspire people. I remember him giving opportunity to musicians of way less than him, but just making them do it, making people play instruments. You know, and that was amazing to see, but you know, it was a sort of gift. I mean, he was a control freak, it could be difficult, but when he, when you're all doing the thing together, he could inspire people to do things they wouldn't think they could do. Um, well, just not not amazing achievements, but just different, just different take on things. Um, so I mean, that's that's what that's why I miss with the modern films and with green screen. You don't get that. It doesn't matter. Put somebody in green screen, they'll zoom in, they'll change the background, change this, change that, change their clothes. You know, it's not you know that working in stone, working in with hard surfaces. That's and that commitment, that's, I think that's, uh, you know, even if it's wrong, you know, getting it wrong, you know, you always get it wrong at times, I've got it wrong. <laughs> um, anymore? Yeah. They're all brushes. They're yeah, all like a pair. Yeah. 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 Because I know the main character, you like me to use Gotham, that was stuck. The radiator. Hugh Jackson was like in the logger. The counterpart, you know, the people felt well, I'm trying to do my thing without getting in their face or the one who's like, well, that, well no, that's wrong, actually, I'm not like, being in their face. Um, I mean, Russell was a bit bouncy, you know, he trying to connect with his eyes, it was a bit difficult sometimes. Um, I don't know, a lot of the, the big lines and you know, people like that, they just, they just turn up and do it, they just know. Just make sure you're ready and, and, and you've lit the line. <coughs> you know, you're not too high, you're not too low, you are catching them. Um, and then, you know, if you get it wrong, just, just jump in and answer it again and say you missed the look or something. You know, camera's the wrong one. lines. Sorry, we didn't get around fast enough. And, you know, I've, I've, I've made directors and I have to go again because I didn't think, oh, that was great. I said, yeah, the, the, you know, we saw it, but we didn't. Camera did get the look and the playback, it's not quite fast enough. Um, well, that'd be okay. Well, well so can we just, you know, just ask for another one? So that, you know, you don't want to ask for too many, especially experienced actors, they don't, they don't do lots of tapes. Um, Ridley does not do lots of tapes either. Um, so it's difficult for me because uh, you still kind of rehearsing, you start shooting, and um, hopefully by take three, you finish line take. Not always. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, no. um, I, just, I don't want to, I don't want, you know, there's one voice on the set. I don't want to talk to actors. You know, it's not like, like it shouldn't be, you know, they, I'm trying to, the crew shouldn't be there somehow. You know, so you don't want to fill them up with too much stuff or, or make them concerned about some technicality. You know, sometimes you see things, oh, I think I'll let that go because it's just it's not appropriate to ask for that toy. Sometimes it is. Um, 
But you know, I think as long as you're polite, <laughs> you can ask for favours. There's one question for me. Good. Let's have it. So I, I have a question regarding. Yeah, I have a question regarding the. Uh, like the colors that uh, that were used in the kingdom of heaven, because I perceive it like the 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 beginning has this cold lighting, and then we, when we move into the desert, they, you mentioned that it's beautiful. It has this warm atmosphere, and then towards the end, through the final scene of the battle, we again we have this cold atmosphere of the morning. So kind of it, it has this uh, the the um, the color of the light makes this full circle. And then in the end, when he comes back, we have this warm light in a place where in the beginning we had the cold light. And so I wanted to ask you, how is it to make this, um, I, uh, what I perceive as a very elaborate uh, thinking throughout this whole film, which is a huge war spectacle. Can you elaborate maybe on this? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I always try and put the color arc into Everything. I mean, Pikachu was just like crazy Japanese, and so Prince Tiger, and then dig out those old blue Congos and all that chrome oranges, and he used to use that and say, Oh, there's a bit of color cause that, you know, that's what we're doing today. So, mm. Memorial Tin. But yes, the other films, you know, we're trying to have a color arc within, so, uh, yeah, Kingdom, it does start in, in its first sort of France in a very brutal, cold winter, and it's, you know, it's the, you feel it. It's, February or something, Christmas has passed, but it's still going to be a long cold winter. There's no food, there's no the salt, the scene in our bottom, everyone's looks malnourished, they need some sun and some cool vegetables. <laughs> but, and then, yeah, you, you move to Holy Land, you're in the Orient, and there's this spice and the colour and the million and dyes and you know, exotic foods and incense burning. Or, you know, strange, exotic-looking people that aren't pale, maybe the Saxon type occasions, and then yeah, and um, and then when the slaughter happens, the dawn, you know, it's the the death and not just the bodies, and, um, and then yeah, he does take um, her back to Luare, which was, and yeah, and there's and then we were trying to get the balance right because it, to keep the coldness of the surround, but then have this lovely warm light and this. Eva looking absolutely edible, you know, in that fur thing, and then just got this green when it was in it was nature live with a uh, a week's seven, six, four wheat on it, if you really want to know. And trying to so it's a slightly warmer look, so half crush, and that to try and pull her off the background. So putting a warm sun in her, yet leaving the environment cold, but it's got it, it seems got optimism when was on those sun thank Christ, you know, there's a little Color on the horizon, and then these heavy skies. But, but that was all film. It was far more difficult to create and to do things on film than it is digitally. So you had to go right up front, as I say, working stone. So we used a we used a, tung a tungsten balanced film without without the correction filters on, and you bring it back as best you can. The printing it doesn't come back all the way, but it gives these beautiful tones. And then when you went to the desert, I used full balanced, heavy Kodak. Um, uh, 50 ASA, really rich, thick, negative, it gave you the colours and stuff, quite difficult to work with again, it's quite contrasting, but it gave you the richness of that battle and the colours and the thing, and the Sadiq standing out there, the dust and the fog and beautiful stuff, and it's really good, at, it's got very fine grain, it's very good at holding contrast, of, but yet keeping a lot of it in there. So that's, uh, and then going back to the Lara again, instead of using the, 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 the uh, heavy, um, it's far too. When it's far too four uh, five oh four five, uh, using another um, uh, using that film, not not again using it more the 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 other tungsten branch which which was a uh, two hundred tungsten uh, bounce film. But then again, I, I corrected it that time, so even looked a bit more you know, a bit more yeah. well, but it still retained the coldness. So yeah, you always always try and put colour arc in the film. You know, you are going somewhere. You know. But I mean, just moving the camera from southern France, well, so, sorry, northern Spain, it wasn't the Pyrenees, to Morocco, 
that does it. <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to, you know, it will help you. You know, you just, I'm not, I'm enhancing things. It was filmed a few years ago with a constant development, which was just fucking horrible. Everything in London was blue steel, everything in Africa was painted red. It's just like, what are you doing? Just shoot London for London and Africa for Africa. Why do you have to do that? You know, um, and it, it just felt, and when they were cross cutting it, it just felt like it was, something was wrong. Well, something wrong with it. It almost felt like there'd, there'd been a bounce in the processing. I thought it was too much. That's my personal taste. But, you know. So, yeah, no, I always think, always try to have a colour art, you know. And then, so, you know, people's introduction, people should have a, I mean, how, how they walk through the door, who, who, who is she, what, what do they look like? First time, um, you know, people laugh at that, but, you know, that thing of making a Hollywood entrance when someone walks through the door. Well, just walk in the door. No, no. How are you? <laughs> you know, it's the first time we see you. First time we establish you. You know, what, what, what's your, you know, what's your, what's your tune? Um, well, I think any more questions we're running out of time tonight. But, uh, so in conclusion, I'd like to thank Paul Madison very much for giving us the benefit of his experience, which is vast, and also openly, obviously, has some great value turning to me and to everybody here. So also, I'd like to thank, uh, before I forget, uh, Mia, Mia, for the projection, because I'm always forgetting and I forget. I shouldn't. Projection is important. We have a player messing up with the light. Thanks for that, too. And all of you for coming very much. Uh, I think it's been a nice thing in the night festival for putting the show on, putting the shows on. Thank you very much.